Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at how we make the most of reactants within chemical processes. This topic considers the decisions that need to be made when we have a chemical process on an industrial scale. The two main things that chemical processes need to consider are how they can maximise their profit and how they can reduce their environmental impact. When looking at process design, there are a few things that we need to consider. First of all is your feedstocks. Feedstock is the word that is used for reactants that are used in industrial processes. You need to think about how available they are. So are you using something that is really easily available? like air or water, or are you using something that's more difficult to come by, like rare metals. How sustainable they are. So are you using something that will eventually run out, like fossil fuels, or again, are you using something that is easily available, like water. And then the cost. The cost of your feedstocks will impact how much profit you can then eventually make. Another thing that needs to be considered is the opportunities for recycling within your process. If your process is not 100% efficient, then you will not use up all of your reactants. So you need to be able to recycle those back into your process. At some point in your reaction, you may produce one of the reactants again and you need to be able to recycle those back in. You need to consider energy within your process. So are you having to heat this reaction quite high? Are you having to use a lot of pressure? If you produce lots of byproducts, how marketable are those? If you can't sell on your byproducts, then they just go to waste and then this means that you won't make as much profit. And then finally, your product yield. How efficient is your process? Are you getting 100% percentage yield? Are you getting something much lower? There are also environmental considerations to in include. The first is that you should be minimising waste. You don't want to have to deal with a lot of waste as this will impact on your profit. You want to avoid using or producing toxic products. These are more difficult to deal with and will have an impact on the environment. And then if possible, you want your products to be able to biodegrade at the end of their life. This means you don't have to think about the costs of dealing with them at the end of their life cycle. These all come under the 12 principles of green chemistry, which have been agreed as the best ways for chemical processes to function. The first principle of green chemistry is that prevention is better than having to treat or clean up waste after it's been produced. The second principle is atom economy. Um, I have a video on how to calculate atom economy, but what this means is that all of the materials that you use within your reactants should be incorporated into your final product. The third principle of green chemistry is that you should have less hazardous synthesis. This means that you have to use or generate substances that have little or no toxicity to humans or to the environment. We should be designing safer chemicals. Your chemicals need to maintain their function for whatever you need to use them for. However, they should be less toxic to both humans and the environment. Number five is that we should be using safer solvents. Solvents and separating agents should be made unnecessary where possible and they should be safe where you use them. They're also a, a problem because they use a lot of energy as they're often heated, cooled, separated, distilled, used under vacuum. So they increase the amount of energy use, which is an environmental problem. 
At the end of their life, they are often incinerated rather than being recycled. Number six is the energy efficiency. At all times, we should be trying to use ambient temperature and pressure, and where we're not, the impact on the environment should be considered and minimised where possible. Number seven is we should be using renewable feedstocks. So we should be trying to cut down our use on fossil fuels as much as possible. Number eight is to re reduce derivatives. Derivatives are steps where things are added onto chemicals, often to protect certain groups, which are then removed at the end. These are additional steps which create waste and should be avoided if possible. Number nine is the use of catalysis. By using catalysis, you can increase your atom economy. Number 10, you should be designing your product so that at the end of its life, it can break down into safe products that do not persist in the environment. Number 11 is the use of real-time analysis to prevent pollution. So by being able to monitor your reaction as it goes along to work out if you're making hazardous substances and preventing them at that stage rather than at the end. And number 12 is safer chemistry for accident prevention. This is so that it's safer for the chemists working on these reactions. Any substances and form of substances that you use should be chosen to prevent accidents and that includes accidents such as explosions or fires. Taken all together, it's hoped that the, green, the principles of green chemistry will make chemistry safer. When looking at industrial processes, we often look at flow diagrams. This flow diagram shows the production of ammonia. So we'll have a look at this in terms of green chemistry. So up here at the start, we have two of the initial reactants. So we have methane, which comes from fossil fuels. This is not ideal, but we're also using water, which is cheap and easy to come by. These are then reacted to produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Air is then put into the system here. And again, this is quite good from a green chemistry point of view and from maximizing profit. That then takes any excess methane and turns that into carbon monoxide and hydrogen. From air, we also have nitrogen. So now flowing through the system, we have nitrogen, hydrogen and carbon monoxide, which are two of those are the reactants that we're looking for. We need to try and get rid of one of these, which is a byproduct. This goes through a catalytic process, which is at a high temperature. Using a catalyst will lower that temperature down, so that is a good aspect. Water is also pumped into this process here and you get the production of nitrogen, hydrogen and now carbon dioxide. This is then compressed, which means that we're working at a higher pressure and goes through another process here with some water. This allows you to separate out water, carbon dioxide and nitrogen and hydrogen. Your water there can then be recycled back into the system. The nitrogen and hydrogen are then passed through a heater. We need to get this up to 450 degrees. However, by using a catalyst, we're able to use 450 degrees rather than a higher temperature. This is then passed through a compressor to get it to 300 uh, bar, which is a high pressure. It goes into the reactor, which also has an iron catalyst, where it produces ammonia. We then use water which is here to cool down the system. And that comes out as steam at the top. So this would be able to be recycled with some of the water that's already in the system. This then produces your leftover nitrogen, hydrogen, and your pr uh, product of ammonia. This is then put into a cooler to allow the ammonia to come off as a liquid and the nitrogen and hydrogen can be recycled back into the system. So from a green chemistry point of view, we do have a lot of recycling happening in this system and only one product that we are going to sell, the ammonia, carbon dioxide would be a waste product here. There is potential that carbon dioxide can be sold for other uses, such as into drinks industry. 
Have a look at this graphic of the Oswald process. The Oswald process is used to produce nitric acid. Try and identify two ways that you could maximise profits and reduce environmental impact in this process. And then think about two ways that this process could be regarded as being green as it is. Pause the video now. So two ways that we could make this process more green would be to put in a recycle within here. So we require water at the absorber stage, but we, we produce water at this initial reactor stage. So we could recycle this water round to here. We require nitrogen monoxide here, but we also have excess nitrogen monoxide here. So this could also be recycled back in to this initial stage here. By doing that, we don't waste any of these products. Two ways in which this process could be regarded as green as it is. We're using air, which is freely available, and we're using water, which we are producing in the reaction. We're also using and producing water, which is non-toxic. This is a schematic of the Solvay process. This is used to produce sodium carbonate. Try and identify two ways that this process could increase its profit and reduce the environmental impact. Two ways that it could also be considered green as it is. Pause the video now. So there are multiple ways that we could improve the profits and reduce the environmental impact of this process. So we use ammonia within the reactor, but we also have an ammonia recovery stage. So the ammonia that is recovered here could be recycled back into the beginning of this reaction. We also produce carbon dioxide at the heating stage of the sodium hydrogen carbonate but we need the carbon dioxide within the reactor here. It is also produced at this stage, but we could also recycle that background into here as well to use that up within this reaction. If you're heating something up, there's often stages where things could be cooled and you could use the water which is produced at this end here to allow for cooling. And you could also sell off any byproducts. So the main byproduct that we produce is calcium chloride. So you could sell that byproduct to make more profit. Ways in which this could be considered green. We're using brine, which you could get from seawater. And it also produces water, which is non-toxic. We're able to recycle round a lot of the other products that we have within this process. In addition to this video, I have videos which relate to making the most of reactants, looking at the calculations involved. For example, calculations on excess, atom economy and percentage yield. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem and Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for regular updates on new videos and flashcards. Bye for now.